Uh, they'll say also, if you don't pray the prayer, then you really don't believe. You got to wad that up and throw it out. That's why I don't do the sinner's prayer. I, I, I can say to people, the prayer doesn't save you, but let's pray. And <laughs> it, it could make them think that, well, at least I said the prayer. I know it didn't save me, but I said the prayer. I want them to focus on Jesus, what he has done. And if there's any prayer involved, it's a prayer of thanks afterwards. Hey there, welcome back to Bible Line. I'm your host, Pastor Jesse Martinez, and today we're answering another listener submitted question along the vein of advice. So let's dive right in. Hello, Pastor Jesse. Hello. I have a question concerning the sinner's prayer. Can't wait to hear it. I know a lot of churches use this, including mine, when they're soul winning or giving an altar call. My question is, is it necessary for an unbeliever to make a verbal confession or call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? The answer to that question is no. I'm not going to go into that answer because we did a uh, at least three-part series on that. It'll be linked in the description. If it is, wouldn't that be adding works to the gospel? Pause. Yes, it would. If we limit the gospel behind a verbal confession, we have an issue. Also, there are people in 1 John chapter 2 that John says they went out of uh, from us, but they were not of us that seems to indicate that these people believed something or said something that they believed that they really did not believe. And over the course of time, separation occurred. So all I'm saying is what is honored is not something necessarily that comes out of the mouth. That's how you can reveal your faith to other people. I, you know, Trent's behind the camera. He know I know what he believes because that's what he tells me. Can he lie to me? Absolutely. Can I lie to him? Absolutely. So what does God judge? He judges what a person believes about Jesus Christ. Specifically, they accept him or they reject him. Continuing. If it isn't necessary, then my next question is, when you're preaching the gospel, whether during soul winning or after a sermon, how do you uh, follow up with getting the individual to trust Christ? I've been taught that going through the, the salvation plan or Romans road, you'd always take them the Romans 10, 9 through 10, comma 13, and then have them say the sinner's prayer. It's confusing to me, pause, because it is confusing, naturally, uh, and, and you'll see here in a moment, <clears throat> resume, because I've heard pastors say stuff like, quote, the prayer doesn't save you, but it's the faith in your heart that saves you. It's Jesus Christ that saves you. Your faith is placed in the object. The object is what we're saved to. And I know people are going to go, hey, ticky-tack-toe, you're getting all nitpicky here. <clears throat> I'm not. But if, if, if we're going to understand, a man can have faith in Buddha, yet his faith does not save him. A man can have faith uh, in Jesus Christ and the sacraments. A man can have faith in Jesus Christ as a prophet, yet not believe that he's the Son of God who died on the cross for sins. That's what Muslims believe. It's the object of our faith that saved us. We are saved by faith alone. We're not adding any works, and that's why I would be against the sinner's prayer. So let me answer his question here. He says, um, if it isn't necessary, my next question is, when you're preaching the gospel, whether during soul winning or after a sermon, how do you follow up with gaining the individual to trust Christ? This is what I do. I go through a seven-point illustration. All right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Perfection is required to get into heaven. You cannot get into heaven by any good works. <clears throat> and there's verses for all of that. Go through our channel. You see this. If, if, if you know that Bible Line is not just a internet show, <clears throat> it's also uh, a ministry, you know at the end of every sermon that I give on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I give a plan of salvation, and I show how the plane is landed, so to speak. So you've got those four points. Uh, when you get to the fifth point is Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who died on the cross to pay for all the sins of all the world. He was buried and rose again three days later. If you put your trust in him, God gives you the free gift of everlasting life. And the seventh point is, once you're saved, you can't lose it because God has said that person is eternally secured. And there's verses for those three points as well. What I do from the pulpit is I make all that clear. A person can get saved as soon as they understand. I mean, there could be any point in there where they put their trust in Jesus Christ. If I'm preaching from the pulpit, I give an invitation where they remain seated. And I say, if that made sense to you today, I would like to pray for you. I'm not having them stand up and come down to the altar so that someone can share the gospel with them. They're already at church. 
they should hear it clearly. Amen? So I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to give the gospel clearly to them. And all I want to know is, if it made sense to you, would you let me know by a raised hand? Some people have accused me as like padding the stats or or making believing equal to raising your hand. Well, that's an equivocation fallacy. I'm not doing that at all. Believing and raising hand are not the same thing. I, I make it very clear, and if people are listening, and the sad part is a lot of my critics are not listening, the raising of hand just indicates that they put their trust in Christ today. But if I'm out on the street talking to somebody, I like to ask this question after I've given the gospel, right? Does that make sense to you? If they say, yeah, then they probably just got saved. But I like to follow it up by saying, why not put your trust? Why not believe that what Jesus did was for you? And if they do that, that's how I land the plane. Then I give them assurance. You know, the Bible says you can never lose your salvation. You know what I don't tell them? Go live it up, brother. Let's go get a beer together. Let's go commit all sorts of weird sin, which is the straw man argument that is always used against once saved, always saved. I encourage them to come to my church. I'd love to see you in church, brother. If you're struggling with anything, you can have victory in Christ. I encourage them to grow. And then that gospel track, I'm like, go give that to somebody else. Do with them what I've done with you. So that's how that's how I would do it. Let's get back to uh, his question here. All right. It's confusing to me because I've heard pastors say stuff like, quote, the sinner's prayer. The prayer doesn't save you, but it's faith in your heart that saves you, end quote. Then they say, quote, if you really believe, then you will pray a prayer, end quote. There's the equivocation issue again. Believing and prayer are not the same thing. And they'll say also, if you don't pray the prayer, then you really don't believe. You got to wad that up and throw it out. That's why I don't do the sinner's prayer. I, I, I can say to people, the prayer doesn't save you, but let's pray. And <laughs> it, it could make them think that, well, at least I said the prayer. I know it didn't save me, but I said the prayer. I want them to focus on Jesus, what he has done. And if there's any prayer involved, it's a prayer of thanks afterwards. Uh, proponents of the sinner's prayer use passages like Romans 10, 9 through 10, 13, John 4, 10, Revelation 3, 20, Luke 18, 13 through 14, etc. They use these as proof texts to defend the sinner's prayer. I know for me personally, this has brought me much confusion and lack of assurance. Right, because you're no longer, let, let me put it this way. A person can say the sinner's prayer, believe what is in the sinner's prayer, and they would be saved. Now, if they're just repeating it, it calls into question, are you repeating it? Are you trusting in the repetition or are you praying? You see how difficult this can be? Just ask him if they will believe on Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, shed his blood, died, was buried, rose again to pay for their sin. Do they believe on him? That's the question that we should ask. <clears throat> That's why I avoid the prayer. Because, you know, this, this young man here, he says it's got a, a lot of a uh, lack of assurance. There were times I prayed that prayer multiple times just to make sure that I was really saved. That, to me, is insanity. I mean, that kind of life is so chaotic to me. Uh, and I'm sorry that you've gone through that. You ain't going to find that here in this church uh, or in the Bible. There's no sinner's prayer. Pray this prayer. I mean, Peter didn't say that, you know. Uh, when I go soul winning, there are times I'm afraid of using the prayer because I think to myself, what if I'm adding to the gospel or I'm afraid I'm not using it because what if I needed to lead them in the prayer for them to be saved? You, you do not have to lead anybody in a sinner's prayer. I would not use it. When I see pastors who I respect use it, I think I wouldn't do that. Not going to judge them, though. But I'm not going to make it so that, well, I did say the prayer. Well, what are you trusting in? Well, I said a prayer one time. I'm not going to give people that ammunition. This is how confusing and concerning this is. I know this email was really long, but I deeply appreciate you taking the time to read. I thank God for your ministry because it really has helped with my assurance of salvation. Don't stop. Keep preaching the gospel. And this is why I wanted to read that. Plain and simple is what he says. Thank you and God bless you. So I hope that that's helpful to you, but that's why I'm a, on the sinner's prayer because it's, it's confusion, you know? And a lot of times in the sinner's prayer, people it's like, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I, I, I know that I can't save myself. Then they'll add all this disgusting stuff when it comes to salvation. Like, I give my life to you. Come into my heart. I prayed that, me right here. 
I prayed that prayer so many times. Lord, come into my heart. I invite you into my heart. You know, and, and that is it's not clear. And you know what I thought as a kid? He lived right here. That I was inviting him in. And when I sinned, he packed up and left. You know what that does to a kid? It doesn't give assurance. I can't imagine what it does to an adult. I think this is why people mock Christianity because the terms are not clear for many other reasons. But anyway. I think I've said enough on that issue. If you have a question, a comment, maybe you've found some success with the sinner's prayer and you want to share your insight on it, I'd love to read your insight. I'm still not going to use it. I appreciate you sharing it, though. But let's get some discussion going in the comments, okay? Email us, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org. Until next time, keep looking up. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Thank you, God bless you, and I'll see you soon. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.